everyone and welcome to what is already the third press conference of IFFR's Tiger Competition. We are streaming live from a studio in Rotterdam. Each day we highlight some of the 14 titles that are part of this year's Tiger Competition. The flagship Tiger Competition is IFFR's unrivaled platform for emerging film talent with a distinct and modernist voice. Today, we will be discussing and speaking with directors of EAMI, Kafka for Kids, and Met Mess. We will present each film and filmmaker for 10 minutes individually, followed by a Q&A session with all the filmmakers collectively. So, dear members of the press, please send in your questions via the Q&A box below your video screen. If the questions are not featured during this press conference, we will follow up with you via email, which also means do not forget to share your contact details. Now, let's get started. The first title we will be dis focusing on today is Eami by Paz Encina. For her third feature-length film, the Paraguayan filmmaker traveled to Chaco, where she immerses herself in the mythology of the area. She listens to the stories and testimonies of the people who are chased off their land. With that knowledge, she creates a magic realist film about a girl called Eami, who wanders the rainforest after her village is destroyed. With its Enchanting images and powerful sound mix, Ayami is a sensorial experience. An indictment of deforestation and the corporate crimes committed against an indigenous people, but also an attempt to record something that will be lost. Let's all welcome filmmaker Paz Encina, and we will be joined by Jasper Jacobs, who will translate for us today. Good morning, hola Paz, and uh, Thank you for joining us in the middle of the night as well. It, uh, it is Buenos quite uh, an undertaking. Yeah. Buenos dias, Paz, y gracias por acompañarnos en la madrugada. Es como bastante bien. So, Hola, buenos dias. Estoy buenos acá muy contenta. I'm very happy to be here. And so are we. Um, a quick question to open up this conversation. Um, why did it take you so long to make your second uh, fiction feature? There was a documentary in between, as, but I'm referring to fiction because, um, as, uh, especially because Amaca Paraguaya was uh, such an international success, and then one would have suspected that the world of film would become your um, your oyster. Uh, tardaste tanto de hacer la, tu segunda película de ficción, considerando que Amaya Preguaca era tan, tan éxito internacionalmente, uno hubiera sospechado que el, la, el mundo de producción de cine sería tu ostra. Bueno, en realidad eh, tenía un proyecto en el medio, eh, no lo pude hacer. Eh, es verdad que con Amaca me fue muy bien, pero también es verdad que vivo en un país muy difícil, sobre todo a nivel cinematográfico. Eh, es un país, eh, tengo, vivo en un país que hace un año tiene un instituto de cine y eso ha dificultado mucho también mi camino, mi producción, mi forma de encarar las cosas. Eh, me ha llevado mucho tiempo poder volver a tomar como como un hilo o, o un camino. 
Yeah, to actually, uh, I had a project in between, but I wasn't able to finish it to realize it. And it's true, yes, Amaka went very well. But what happens is, and we live in a country where it's very difficult to talking about c cinema. It's very hard. Actually, it's only a year ago that we have a cinema institution here. So to produce these things, it took me a very long time. It was quite difficult to get it done. Yeah, it's good also that you can explain a bit more on that because here, you know, from uh, Europe where we have strong public support, it's also hard to, you know, imagine how difficult it must be. Yeah. Sí, quizá puedes explicar un poco más, pero que aquí desde Europa tenemos un uh, apoyo tan grande de fiscal de, de finanzas, es difícil imaginar cómo es ahí. Bueno, nosotros tenemos hace un año una ley de cine que eh, un instituto de cine Estuvimos 20 años trabajando en la ley de cine, esperando que el Estado la apruebe. Fueron muchos años, 20 años es mucho, año, es mucho tiempo. Bueno, well, we uh, have a, a the, for a year now we have actually a cinema law and we have for a year now finally a cinema institution and we struggled for that for 20 years. It was a long time, 20 years to struggle for that. Yeah. Y, eh, y también venimos de, de una dictadura de 35 años eh, eso también ha parado mucho las cosas and we also Justamente, come from a dictatorship that took 35 years that also has stopped and, and stagnated many things y entonces para nosotros eh, prácticamente con Amaca Paraguaya fue como comenzar un camino que creo que, que hemos hecho igualmente muchas cosas eh, para lo que el país nos permitía hacer Eh, creo que se han hecho muchas películas y que, que, que son películas a las que les ha ido muy bien en Europa, pero nos cuesta mucho tener una continuidad. Yeah, and actually in the practice with Amaya we did a lot of things and we went a long way. We have been able to do many things also with films that went very well in Europe. So we did get actually quite far. Yeah. Prácticamente eh, yo hago Amaca Paraguaya sin tener una, un país con un pasado cinematográfico. Actually, I made Amaya Paraguaya in a country which does not have, actually does not have a cinematic, cinematographic past, no cinematographic history. Yeah. And that also made quite a, quite a loud bang once it came out. I quite distinctly remember that. Um, I would uh, want to now ask to uh, be a bit more specifically about the film we are presenting here, and that is, um, why did you choose to film with and among the Ayoreo? Um, what did you what did you know about them before starting the film? And um, perhaps also it would be good to hear how well are they known as part of Paraguayan culture. Sí, ahora quisiera preguntarte más específico. Me acuerdo que era bastante éxito Amaya con un golpe fuerte que dio Amaya um, Mamaca, perdón. Y por qué elegiste decidiste de filmar con y de dentro los Ayoreo y qué Sabías de ellos en, antes de empezar la película y co, en cuántos niveles son conocidos ellos como parte de la cultura paraguaya. Yo los eh, sabía de ellos porque había trabajado hace muchos años eh, en un programa periodístico eh, donde habíamos ido a la comunidad. Estoy hablando de hace 25 o 30 años atrás. Eh, que yo ya había escuchado de ellos y ya había hecho un pequeño trabajo con ellos. Yeah, I knew about them because I worked with them for a very long time with a journalistic work. It was like ages ago, like 25 years ago. Then I had known about them. I learned about them to, by, by having done a small journalistic uh, documentary thing, work. Eh, <clears throat> yo quería hacer una historia de amor convencional. Eh, Tenía muchas ganas de filmar algo así. Y un amigo mío me dijo, mira, hay una historia de amor que está muy bien eh, en la comunidad Ayoreo. Era una historia de amor entre dos hermanos. Y yo apenas supe de esta historia, me volví loca y la quise, la, la quise filmar. And I wanted to do a love story. And this is what a friend told me about. Is, yeah, there is this love story, a really good love story about two brothers and I heard about it and that gave me very much feeling that I really want to film there. Eh, fui entonces a hablar con la comunidad y la comunidad me dice, sí, es 
esa historia existe, pero a nosotros no nos interesa que la cuentes. So I eh, went to tampoco. talk to the community and I said, yeah, this story does exist, but we don't really feel like that you're going to tell it. Eh, para nosotros el amor es otra cosa, me dijeron. Y ahí yo les pregunté, ¿qué es el amor para ustedes? Y me dijeron, lo que estamos haciendo nosotros ahora, estar juntos y poder conversar, poder unirnos con la palabra. And what they said is like love for, for us is something else. So I asked, what does love mean for you? And that's actually what we're doing now, that we can sit together and talk and exchange words. Y ahí les pregunté, ¿qué quisieran ustedes que, que yo cuente? Simplemente por una curiosidad, ni siquiera pensaba que iba a ser una película eh, fuera de, 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 de lo que en ese momento deseaba. Y me dijeron, a nosotros nos gustaría que, que hables de lo que es sentirse lejos del lugar, de, de uno. ¿Que hables de lejos del lugar? Eh, lo, que es, lo que es estar fuera del lugar propio. Ah, so I asked them what would you want to do, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought at all about doing anything else than what I was planning to. And at that moment, at that moment they told me, well, we'd like to, to talk about what it's like to be away from your own place. And to be far away from your own place. Y ahí pensé, bueno, eso es de lo que estuve hablando todo este tiempo, del exilio, de la diáspora, de la pérdida. Y ahí sentí que esta película me venía como un destino. So and that's what I thought of being away, having been away very long, like being in exile, being in the diaspora, being lost. And then I felt that this was like this film was probably supposed to be my destiny. Well, y simplemente comencé a trabajar con ellos y, y dejé, dejé llevarme como por los deseos que tenía la comunidad. So then I simply started working with them and I had to, I just let myself be carried along with the wishes that came out from their community. And I understand from what you say that actually you developed the narrative once you started talking to them and this story was largely shaped from these uh, dialogues and these talks. But I wonder how much did it also influence uh, the aesthetic of the film? Sí, entiendo que simplemente ibas desarrollando, de, 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 desarrollando la película, hablando con ellos, los diálogos se eh, llevaron a cabo así. Y me gustaría saber cuánto inf, influenció a las, la estética de la película. Todo, porque la, conce porque la concepción espacio-temporal eh, de los Totu y de no es nuestra... Concepción espacio temporal. So our conception of it is something that's temporary, passingly. That's every, always. En un momento yo pregunté a uno de ellos cuántos años tenías cuando cuando salís cuando dejaste el monte y me dijo no lo sé me dijo habré tenido 13 o 15 años como diciéndome yo no pienso el tiempo como vos lo pensás yo no so yo I... no me pienso en años. I asked once, how old were you when you had to leave the jungle? And he said, well, I don't know when you had to leave your place. I think I was maybe 13 or 15 years, but we don't think the way in years, as you people think, we don't think in years of age. Y ahí comprendí que tenía que pensar el tiempo de una manera distinta a la que yo pensaba. So there I understood, I had to think of time in another way of the way I think about it. Y que también ellos se cuentan a través de lo que para nosotros podría ser un universo eh, de fábula o mágico, pero que para ellos es un cotidiano. So then I thought that's something for them, and that's for us actually, it's like a, a universe of fables of, of magic, but actually for them it's like daily life. Entonces, simplemente me dejé llevar porque, por, por la situación de que alguien pueda hablar con un lagarto o de que habla una planta o de que las plantas son madres que protegen. Simplemente me dejé llevar por una concepción, por una visión distinta del mundo. So, actually, I let myself be carried along that somebody could talk to a... Um a lizard or that to talk to plants or that plants were like mothers. I just let myself be carried along with 
this other world. Y también ahí sentí que si bien la historia que yo pensaba que quería contar era distinta, estaba siendo de todas maneras una historia de amor. So and then I felt like even though I was making another story than what I thought I was going to do, still I was making a story about love. I, I definitely felt it in this way, and it was really immersed in every sound and every image that uh, you presented to us. Uh, although there is some sense of familiarity and universality of language that you can develop uh, with this film, I do wonder how complicated was it for you to shoot in a language that I assume you didn't know and had to learn, or perhaps you learned it before? parte familiar que era más o menos universal, pero quisiera saber el lenguaje, el idioma, cómo lo filmaste, tenías que aprender, cómo era filmar en un idioma que no conocías, tenías que aprender el idioma, cómo lo hiciste. Eh, en realidad el guión yo escribí en español con la asistencia de, 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 de un joven líder de la comunidad. Actually, I wrote the script in Spanish with the help of a young leader of the community. Eh, y luego lo que hice es trabajar con este líder todo el tiempo y a su vez trabajó conmigo un asesor intercultural. And so there you go. I kept on working afterwards with this leader all the time and I also had like an intercultural advisor. Esta persona trabaja hace 20 años con la comunidad y entonces entre los tres íbamos eh, conformando una escena, todo con la traducción del líder. So this man of this person also works for 20 years with the community. So the three of us we would make would try to get conformity in the scenes, always working with this young leader. And he was translating. Y por otro lado, el hecho de que esté el líder fue algo muy beneficioso para nosotros porque ellos tienen una estructura vertical, entonces sure. todos hacían lo que el líder quería que hagan. So, and working with this young leader was actually very good for us, very effective, because they have like a vertical structure, so we basically did all the leader told us. Ahora también nosotros hacíamos lo que el líder quería que haga, porque yo podría hacer, yo hacía un casting, elegía los actores, pero después llegaban los que el líder quería que lleguen. Ah, yes. So we also did, so the leader did what we wanted, but we also did what the leader wanted. Like, for instance, we had a casting, but then the leader decided who would come for the casting. Entonces, era todo el tiempo un, un, como unas negociaciones a las que estábamos. Eh, de repente, eh, es que lo que nosotros hacemos es como absurdo, de alguna manera, para una comunidad indígena. No terminan de entender... Eh, que implica una película, cuando usted, cuando la vean, yo creo que eso va a cambiar. Pero mientras la hacíamos, les parecía todo muy absurdo. So, it's actually, there was always, we are also kind of in a negotiation, but for them it seemed very absurd, like the indigenous community, that they couldn't figure out what it implies to make this film. But I guess after we'll see it, that will change. I think so too. Pero and, uh... eso... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go. No que eso no era así para los niños, y entonces eh, fue muy fácil filmar con ellos, para ellos era un juego, entonces simplemente era muy fácil todo. So it did, that didn't count for the kids, the children, for them it was very easy to film, for them it was simply a game, so it was very easy to film with them. Yes, I can imagine it, can, it could have been some, something quite playful and I would uh, love to you know, continue discussing this with you for hours because already this was uh, very informative. Uh, so thank you very much, Pazensina. We will see you back later at the Q&A. And uh, now onwards to our next contender. The next film we will be discussing today is Kafka for Kids by Roy Rosen. In this partly animated singspiel, Kafka's metamorphosis is staged as a children's TV show that 
cheekily aims to make the writer's tales understandable for kids. The story is read in live action by charismatic granddad figure to a young girl, while Sansa's transformation is depicted in expressive animations. They are joined by a toy band and surrounded by a li lively backdrop where Mr. Lamp and Mrs. Table have faces and get involved in everything. I wonder how it would be look if I would have a table that talks. With a sweet, sweetly perverse godliness, politics, philosophy, and notions of childhood are wondrously brought together in Kafka for Kids. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the filmmaker Roy Rosen, and hello to you, Roy. Now that uh, Hi, Vanya. Thank you I, when I see this band, I was trying to wonder, can I borrow them also uh, for uh, this set so they can animate in between the talks with the filmmakers? I think they would fit pretty well. Yeah. I'm sure with the uh, proper pay, they'll accept your invitation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to know. Uh, looking, so looking at your, I mean, I know you for, as a filmmaker, as an artist for a very long time now and following your work. So when I look at your complete oeuvre, it really does feel to me that everything in one way or another was indeed heading towards this film as a, in a way it plays as a sum total of your adventures, both I think in cinema and art so far. So. When did you really start to think about doing Kafka like nobody ever did Kafka before? Well, it, it, it has been a long process. And I was showing a film uh, 13 years ago in uh, Marseille. And I was surprised because the uh, Q&A included a lot of questions about Kafka. So people recognized uh, the extent of his influence on me. And at the time, I was thinking in terms of self-betrayal, how could I shock myself or scandalize myself or negate things that I believe in. And I thought that my last uh, sacred cow, my last uh, venerated author, the thing that I would not uh, dare touch was Kafka, both because I, I thought he was impossible to uh, profoundly uh, interpret, but also uh, I thought that uh, treason or betrayal would be a form of uh, kind of violent love that can bring out uh, qualities in myself and in Kafka that otherwise would stay covert. So already in that early stage, I knew that I would deal with the uh, metamorphosis. I, and I knew that I would do something which is terrible, which, which is to draw Gregor Samsa the vermin, something that Kafka did not want to uh, happen. And I also knew already then that I would like the film itself to go through a metamorphosis, uh, not to stay what it promises to be. Uh, but then when I came back to Israel and began working on it, I worked for several months and I came to feel that it was a failure, that uh, it cannot be done. And it stayed dormant for another five years or so until a friend curator uh, asked me about this idea and it triggered the renewed uh, faith. So I would say five years ago, I began working seriously uh, again on the script. And then it already gained other dimensions, the political dimension and the uh, visual dimension that was quite different. Yes, which brings me uh, indeed to the question, uh, well, I think you partly already started addressing it, and that is where it was clear from the beginning that you would want to work with uh, animation or it was in a way suggested, it suggested itself while you were developing the project. Yeah. Well, a... Uh, I think, well, I'm a painter primarily, and uh, my paintings always had a kind of an animistic quality. So still as they were, uh, a series of painting might include a, a, a face that changes or landscape that uh, transforms itself. And um, I wasn't sure how, uh, what kind of means would I have in producing the film. So I began by doing labor intensive gouaches that would accommodate very simple animation. So there would be backdrops and many, many uh, uh, faces and figures, uh, thinking that if it would not turn, if, if it would not be realized as animation, I would simply be able to shoot it myself by moving the figures in a very rudimentary, primitive way. But then fortunately, later on, I met uh, you know animators that were good enough. I, I knew that it, it's gonna be very, uh, simple, not, nothing like, you know, spectacular 3D or anything like that. 
but it was a kind of a uh, slow evolution. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the question as well of the musical pieces. How did they make their way into the film? And if you can talk about that too, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, I, I, I always uh, worked very seriously with music. I, I like to think of music not only as a ambience or something that uh, creates a stronger effect, but uh, as something that is really substantial and foundational in a film, just as much as characters, uh, aesthetics, uh, structure, etc. And uh, Igor Kotogolov, the wonderful composer I worked with, uh, is someone with whom I had a creative dialogue for the past decade. The last uh, work we did together was called The Dust Channel, which was a kind of an operetta, but for a completely different um, orchestration, more Baroque oriented. Um, and uh, as we began discussing the film, I must say also that I knew that part of uh, hurting Kafka was taking some of the most horrid scenes of uh, the metamorphosis and turning them into, you know, nice, uh, cheerful uh, nursery, uh, children rhymes, uh, such as, you know, the scene where the, the father throws apples on Gregor could be an excuse uh, for a merry film, a merry song about apples. And then uh, it was the uh, ego's idea to use the toy orchestra, which also meant uh, some uh, musical limitations because some of the toy instruments have, you know, only one key or only full tones. So certain limitations, which were a good thing to work with. Uh, and then of course, there are all there are seven wonderful characters uh, that could become and, and be very compelling in this a surrounding which is a twilight zone between you know subjects and objects where everything is alive and everything is also objectified yeah i think the twilight zone uh, brings it even closer to me it's a good way of uh, addressing it and now well speaking of addressing something such as also perhaps an elephant in the room i think we can p refer to it a bit like that because the film itself um, goes through a sudden metamorphosis, metamorphosis but it is in a very unexpected way at least it was for me and it switches to a charged political monologue starting with the question what is a child and um, here childhood is addressed as a transitory state in occupied territories ruled by a military law so um, please can we dive into into that a bit as well Sure. I mean, it was. I. I mean, I. I always thought that there will be a political layer to the film, but it was not uh, planned. Uh, uh, but it was this uh, trajectory, this uh, junction of, on the one hand, uh, the notion and tropes of childhood, which I found myself uh, thinking about, and of course, notions and structures of uh, legal thinking and writing, which Kafka, as a doctor of law, dealt with in his daily life, but also in his writing. And as I was writing the script, there was this incident uh, of a 12-year-old child, uh, only called by the letter D, who was detained uh, at the gateway of a settlement with a knife in her overcoat. And she was um, a sentenced for four and a half months in prison, which she spent in an adult female prison. So it really begged the question, what is a child? Uh, and it uh, took me on a trail, you know, living aside for a second, uh, you know, Kafka literature and scholarship and into the realm of uh, the very bizarre realm of military law. Um, it's a kind of a very strange literature because it's not like civil law. It's written by the, the occupied territories commander. It's uh, uh, always amended and revised. It's in effect, one can say the way that the law would, would be when it is really illegal. Uh, how would you justify something that uh, is so contradictory to our notions of law, such as, you know, basic things such as uh, borders, uh, civic rights, uh, childhood, etc. Um, so it, I think that the, the story really uh, forced itself upon me. And then the big question was how exactly to uh, to make it fit into the into the film. Initially, I thought it would be fully documentary. I could imagine a panel discussion with lawyers and legal activists. But then I realized that it had to become a kind of a monodrama, that uh, this kind of ambiguity between documentary and fiction had to pertain to, the, to this uh, serious uh, material as well. 
And here, the next question that uh, becomes very obvious, at least for me, that is you worked here once again with the amazing and incredibly talented Hanni Furstenberg. I mean, I think I know the answer already, but I want to hear about your long collaboration as well. But that what does have, uh, what does she have that makes you enjoy working with her so much? Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, she is incredible. And the first thing we did together was uh, another case of self-betrayal. Uh, in, in 2010, I did a film called Hilarious, which was a kind of a dysfunctional stand-up comedy. I always saw myself as working within a kind of a heroic comic mode, comicality that is really has a kind of a transgressive uh, um, dimension. And uh, I wrote this betrayal of comedy, this uh, dysfunctional comedy, which meant that it needed an actress that could be at the same time funny and profoundly not funny. Uh, and I, I auditioned many actresses until Hani came in and uh, it was immediate magic. She's incredibly uh, intelligent and uh, charismatic and, and total in her approach. And it was again a, a kind of a monodrama, a monologue, which he really possessed fully. And ever since then, I had the dream of working with her again and writing something especially for her. And the monologue, in a way, became a kind of a contrapunct. Uh, if Hilarious was a, a collapse in a comic mode, this is a collapse in a more dramatic, a dramatic mode. And they kind of, I see them as a kind of two complementary pieces. The monologue is a, is a sovereign a monodrama and hilarious. And it's only, she was in fact the only actress in the cast for whom I knew that the role is written for. And it definitely turned out to, to breed the right choice. Uh, I also was very amazed with her corporal acting as well. There's so much, as you say, charisma and intelligence that she can embody. And in a way she becomes possessed as well with the, you know, with her character. Thank you very much, Roy Rosen. Um, members of the press, do send your questions to the filmmakers via the Q&A box underneath this screen. And now, let's move on to the third and final film of today. The next title we will be discussing is the Dutch production Met Mes by Sam de Jong. In this film, we see two teenage boys who are obsessed with fancy sunglasses. But when Yusuf steals the video camera of a famous TV presenter to trade it for the glasses, she exaggerates the story and tells the police she was robbed at knife point. Nobody believes Yusuf's side of the story and he is sent to prison. Met Mess offers the viewer a deliriously colorful vision of society's more absurd sides. Through subdued humor, hyper-stylized fluorescent imagery, and funky perspectives, a story is told of hypocrisy and stigmatization, one that is painfully common. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Sam De Jong, who is joining us live on stage. Who the more has Sam? Um, welcome. It's I feel privileged to be here. Well, I have, I, I have the same privilege. I don't have a talking lamp or a table, but I do have a talking guest. This is wonderful and the first one for me. So it's great to have you here. Yeah, yeah. likewise. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to start with a simple premise of questions for your film. But did, uh, some, did anybody ever steal your camera? No, no, that, that never happened, actually. What was then the trigger for this uh, sort of uh, premise of your film? Uh, well, it was mainly a reflection on the power you have as a filmmaker, and um, yeah, that that triggered it. Mm. And uh, let's uh, before we enter more into the story, what I would like to focus on is this um, very um, sort of stylistic and fluorescent, as we were saying, you know, visually very dashing and almost surrealist style that uh, an atmosphere that your films possess. So I wonder. Do you already know where visually you're going to go with for your film at the very beginning of your project or it starts developing uh, with time? Um, th in this case, it was, def it, it was definitely a close collaboration with the production designer, the cinematographer, mm -hmm. the costume designer. And, and um, it, made, it, it was a lot of fun because um, very often you are having conversations on um, yeah, how to be... Um, 
how, how to not be too aggressive for your department and how to make sure that that everything is driving the content and the heart of the movie. But for this film, be, because we were struggling with an issue that we were making a movie about stigmatization, so we're, we're showing a kid that is being uh, ethnically profiled in a way, and by making the movie, we were contributing to this. So, so this was a dilemma we, um, we tried to tackle, and it ended up leading to a, to a stylization of the film where we wanted the film to be constantly present for the viewer, so that you were constantly aware of uh, the fact that you are watching a movie and are being actively manipulated. And this led to every department uh, having the freedom to be, to be completely, like ma make themselves visible uh, from uh, custom to uh, color, color grading, which uh, is still something I, you know, it's, it's, it's painful to your eyes at times. And I still wake up at night sometimes thinking like, what did we do and are we not alienating anyone? But we, there was just only one way to make this movie and that was this way at the time we made it. And, uh, and, uh, but yeah, no, so it, we, we were, it was a very big, a big group, group process for sure. And speaking of alienation, this is something actually I sometimes, well, in this film, I associate also with your actors because uh, they need to play something that uh, is so out there and also perhaps some, sometimes also alienating to themselves. And I wonder, because they have to play complete strangers, you, you know, yeah. from what they are. It is an inherent practice of being an actor, but still, I wonder in this case particularly, is everybody willing to go there, you know? Um. Yeah, I think in the rehearsals, because acting was also a department, right? So, so they also um, made their acting style very visible and uh, almost robotic at times. Um, and they enjoyed that, but we, that was something we really explored in the, in, the, in the auditions and just trying to make everything unnatural, basically, which was fun, you know, but also I think that at times we were just, but I, I always think this is a good feeling when you're when you're when you're doing something. And you're like, oh, and it's scary, and you and you're like, are we really going this direction? <laughs> and it's like, uh, yeah, we are, and uh, and everybody's just like holding hands and <laughs> and and, and uh, jumping in the how do how do you call it the, the deep end? Yeah, the yeah. deep end of the pool. Yeah, yeah in this uncanny. Deep yeah, end yeah, of the pool, uncanny I deep think. end. And <laughs> But I just watched the movie with uh, uh, Shaheen and uh, Hadwig, the two main actors, mm -hmm. and uh, they absolutely loved it. So that was a nice moment. Yeah. And uh, what I know, knowing your previous two films, uh, you are always, uh, you know, very interested in portraying young people, right? And how some simple situations can uh, quickly turn into tragedies, uh, whether if it's a, a misunderstanding or, you know, a, rob a completely warped viewpoint uh, yeah and uh what can you tell, tell us more about your focus or maybe it's fascination also with it yeah, yeah um i also find it always quite hard to uh because i i've i you know you i'm being viewed for a few things i've made while i have so many things i still want to make mm -hmm. so uh it's it's always a bit uh, hard to reflect on that process because I feel like I'm so right in the middle of it still actively, but um, well, this movie definitely was a reaction on my previous two films and uh, also uh, explored, I think, for me, uh, an urge to um, yeah, m uh, critique myself mm -hmm. and my motivations and um, and therefore, I, the, the, yeah, it, it was, it was um, uh, yeah, bigly related to the to the other two and uh yeah and there is you know you're returning to the netherlands with it yeah, yeah, yeah. i was so in I the think u.s for saying, a little bit yeah, yeah you're saying you know critique to myself but also critique perhaps of where you're coming from you had to in a way address that too yeah yeah uh, you mean coming from literally from the U.S.? No, or? coming yeah, and to deciding you know as you say in response with your third film, yeah, you you had to you know perhaps also come and shoot it here. Yeah, no, for sure. I yeah. I, I also uh, I I uh, f I, f I it was definitely time to go uh, go back home uh, for sure, and uh, and it was uh, in that sense a lot of fun because it, we we made this right after the first lockdown and everybody was just so in uh, so in love because. Mm. 
we realized how much fun it is to actually interact with each other and be on set together. And, and I think that that energy, like a lot of it was just about having fun together. And, uh, and I think the movie hopefully channel, channels that yeah. energy. And I was wondering, uh, looking at Yusef and his character, could he or could you have imagined him also being um, a Yoast? Or Hank? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, no, no. The, the movie is definitely about, uh, I mean, racial tensions, mm. and uh, but but almost to a to an extent where they're stereotypes yes. of how the media portrays and them, how you push them, as and how as I might have portrayed people in the past. Yeah. So uh, uh, so I take full uh, responsibility if if uh, you know if I stigmatized anyone in the movies I've made which I sure which I'm sure uh, of that I might have done but uh, that's maybe up to other people but uh, yeah th th this was quite hard but th mm. that that definitely is it so it's a it's a heated heated topic and uh, and th and therefore I, th I also felt that um, the lightheartedness uh, of the film helped mm -hmm. to make it more digestible in a way yeah. but also the friction between the topic and the style uh, interested me mm -hmm. yeah i understand and i think it works in that way quite well together at least this is what uh, sort of disowned me when watching the films because mm -hmm. there is a provocation and there, there is lightness to it that is a completely you know uh, dashing style as well and uh, yeah, yeah I think uh, you made right choices at least as it comes from you know from oh. here and uh, for our international audience why the title Met Mess can you explain it uh, well it's the so these are the two words that become sort of a mantra in the film that make up the lie of the Evelyn the female mm -hmm. protagonist and uh, so that, that's what Met Mess meant and uh, yeah and there's this trend in the Netherlands for uh, Dutch language films that have no relationship with uh, Anglo-Saxon culture to have Dutch, uh, English titles and it speaks a bit to a I think a devaluation of our, our language and and uh, and our movie has no English release uh, plan so we were like we'll just as a statement keep keep our Dutch title and be a bit more French about it. <laughs> That's a right way of putting it. And yeah. Uh, yeah, even if it gets perhaps an international distribution, we, plan, we, why we not might change it? Yeah. <laughs> no, we we keep it. Yeah, yeah, we keep it. Yeah. Sam de Jong, thank you very much for uh, being here with us, and please uh, keep me company on yeah, this stage okay. while we are going to be addressing the questions from the press members. All right. Before we dive into those questions, a reminder about the Tiger jury, who is currently watching the films on the big screen. Good for them. The jury consists of five members, Juji Bankuti, Ruth van den Berge, Tatiana Leite, Tekla Reute, and Farid Tabarki. They will grant three prizes, the Tiger Award worth 40,000 euros and two special jury awards worth 10,000 euros each. The Tiger competition winners will be announced on February 2nd during our awards ceremony. And now, time to get to some questions from our press members. And please give me a moment that I find them on our, my iP iPad. I said iPad. All right, first a question uh, to Paz and Sina. Uh, it says, could it be deducted from uh, what you say that your filming was not an imposition of your ideas on the community and therefore an exercise in uh, decoloniza decolonization. <laughs> I'm sorry. Podría, se podría entender como deducir que tu película al principio no estabas en la comunidad o haciendo lo que hacía la comunidad, que podría ser como un tipo de decolonización. Bueno, eh, en Paraguay tenemos una relación muy distinta con lo indígena de lo que generalmente se conoce. En Paraguay tenemos una relación muy diferente con la comunidad indígena de lo que es muy diferente de lo que la gente en general sabe. No tenemos eh, que viajar tan, eh, tantos kilómetros ni tantas horas para tener contacto con lo indígena. Eh, porque además nos reconocemos eh, como descendientes de indígenas. 
So we don't have to travel so many kilometers, so many hours to get in touch with uh, indigenous. So we kind of recognize ourselves as descendants from the indigenous. Eh, nuestra lengua oficial es el guaraní, que es una lengua indígena. And our official language is Guarani, which is an indigenous language. Pero sí hubo un, un proceso de decolonización eh, en relación a mis deseos. But yes, there was a process of decolonization related or connected to my wishes, what I wanted. Respondí la pregunta. Did I answer the question? Yeah, uh, to me, yes, very much so. So I'm going to just uh, ask another we'll one see. that yeah, that came and says the title of the film means world and forest in uh, Ayoreo. What do you prefer? Why actually do you prefer to spell it in capital letters? Eh, otra pregunta que el título, Eami, significa mundo y bosque. Y cuál es, cómo es que preferías de, eh, es, de deletearlo en en mayúsculas. Siempre me pareció una palabra tan grande, tan grande, tan grande. I always thought of it as a word that was so big, so big, so big. Eh, inclusive eh, en el afiche, en, en un momento la pusieron en letras minúsculas y a mí me parecía que no, que era una palabra tan inmensa y que además tu lugar te parezca al mundo, me parecía algo tan hermoso que siempre lo pensé en mayúsculas. Even once we had it on the poster, we had it in small letters, and, but I always thought it was such an immense word and it's such a beautiful word, it's so astounding, so I figured no, it has to be in capital letters. Well, this is also a beautiful answer to it. Thank you very much, Paz. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the question from the press to Roy Rosen. It says, I remember there was a theater play called Kafka for Kids at the Edinburgh Fringe a couple of years ago. Is there uh, a connection with the film? Well, no, I actually just discovered it uh, much to my, uh, it was quite scary to discover that there was something like that. And as I was working on Kafka for Kids, which again was an idea that I was uh, working on for a decade or more, I realized that some people treated seriously what I saw as a horrifying and ludicrous idea. So I didn't see this uh, production, but I imagine it must be quite different in its approach to what I've been pursuing. I now am curious about it too. Uh, there is one more question saying, one can say your film is a very transparent work about a creative process. Um, did you have a final idea about uh, what the final result was going to be? Or the viewer is in a way seeing you invent the film while in the process? I think very much the latter. I mean, I think that my work tend to look in retrospect, very structured and uh, determined. Uh, but in fact, there were, as I was describing, there were a couple of very um, unstable moments. Uh, one of which was, of course, the moment in which I realized that I might sacrifice my entire conception of the film in favor of uh, this um, uh, dive into the uh, military law in the occupied territories. And then also how to realize it in, in cinematic terms. Uh, so there has been a couple of uh, moments like this, and I think that also it's something that I find myself constantly pursuing in my work. Uh, I mentioned that I'm a painter, I'm a writer, I make films, but nothing about the medium or the genre is a preconceived notion for me. It's always it has to justify itself and to, to reinvent itself. And that was very much the case with uh, this film as well. And uh, it's quite amazing for us here to witness that as well, on uh, either on a big screen or in a gallery space. Thank you very much, Roy. And I'm going to turn to uh, our guest here in the studio, Sam. Uh, it says, uh, you started with uh, young main roles in your films, and it says short films in brackets, short. But uh, you see that in your last film that characters are older, they're growing. <laughs> did, you, uh, did the character grow with you as a person? Um, yeah, hopefully. I mean, 
Although I think I could really make movies about uh, adolescence my entire life, I, I felt that I had to challenge myself a bit to uh, uh, get closer to who I am. Uh, and uh, so I'm in the process of that. And, uh, and I th I, yeah, like I said, I think that this film probably reflects that, that journey. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, I see here the next question that uh, relates to it very much and also what we have mentioned in our uh, discussion. It says, you mentioned before that you're happy to come back uh, to the Netherlands after your adventure in the US. What, and now it says attracts, I don't know. What attracts you to the Dutch film culture? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's more of, um, being uh, at a place where you feel safe and where you have all your memories and all your uh, uh, connections. And uh, also working in your native language was something I underestimated when I, because uh, I think a lot of my work was intuitive and I, I wasn't that aware of my process. But I realized working in a in another language that that I actually struggled uh, com making clear what my vision was in detail. And as we moved along in the creative process, uh, I realized that uh, that that you know that comes at a price. And after that realization, I felt a bit silly for leaving. Uh, a world and a film culture where there's so much support here and also it's such so important that you learn how to in detail uh, express your vision mm -hmm. that I I thought for the next couple of years it would be beneficial for my career to be here and, yeah. and first uh, work work on my language here and film language film language as yeah. well and i think uh well yeah your uh, mother tongue also allows you i suppose to dive deeper you know into what you were saying your own prejudices maybe and, yeah uh, so it's not only about uh you know how it is facilitated here at your home but i think it also enables you to so, sort of uh remove some obstacles that you would encounter in other countries and dive into some prob problems or problematics that you want to address yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's well put. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. And uh, thank you to all the filmmakers for joining us today. And thank you all for joining the conversation. This is yet again it for today. And if we didn't get around to your particular questions, we'll get to them via the email later today. So uh, please do get in touch with IFFR Press Office to arrange your one-on-one -on -one interviews with the Tiger Competition filmmakers and other talent. We will see each other again tomorrow to present our fourth and final press conference with Acriansa, Proyecto Fantasma and The Cloud Messenger. Meanwhile, also enjoy the rest of this year's program through our partners at Festival Scope Pro. Thanks again and see you tomorrow. Just show me then go you hold that dance.